only found on some fluke. You know what I got, Molly? Post it. No. Post it. Where are we going to stand? <laughs> <laughs> but then we have our back to some people. You know, I don't like it. <laughs> I think we're going to almost have to stand over behind um, Sharon. So that we're not. Are we offsetting? Hmm? Are we just again? No, just it's when we do the presentation. Oh, okay. When we do the presentation. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, then we could all just sit. <laughs> yeah, I think we just go ahead because we're, yeah, that'll get, they'll come in. Good evening. I'd like to open the uh, public meeting for the Falmouth Public School Committee for December 10th, 2019. Uh, can we all ri rise for the pledge, please? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Some students, please. Okay, this is a ball. 
<laughs> that students write in their goods and bads about the various schools around the district. This is from the Lawrence School. This is from William. And he says, I love my principal because he is passionate about his job. I don't think Mr. Bushy paid him to write that. I know. I know. He, yeah. Okay. This is from Charlotte, who goes to T Ticket School. And she says, I love learning because it gets me smarter. <laughs> and the maroon ones are from the high school. This is from Haley at the high school. And she says, my teacher challenges me by pushing me to do my best on all of my assignments. So thanks for those words from the kids. <laughs> Thank you. We've implemented that about a year, and a year or so ago. And I think it's just really rewarding our impression since we deal with students. And that's the major impact of what we do to read statements from kids. I just think that's, that's fantastic. And we'll change substance a little bit. The mission of the Falmouth Public Schools is to educate students so that they are engaged in their education in a way which develops their capacity to pursue their goals and foster lifelong learning. The three core beliefs which define us as a school system enable us to accomplish our mission are, one, continuous improvement of students, teachers, staff, and administrators. Two, enthusiasm in teaching and learning. And three, collaborative in teaching and learning. The role of the school committee is threefold. To write policy, to approve the operating budget, to hire the superintendent and support her in carrying out her initiatives for the, for the district. I'll remind everyone that this meeting is being telecast and recorded on channel 14. I also remind any member of the public who wishes to make an audio or video recording of the open session of this meeting to first notify me as the chair, and then I will inform the public of the recording as required by the open meeting law. Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's pretty standard procedure. <laughs> uh, public comment, please. Yes. My name is Patricia Oshman. I am from the town of Falmouth, Affirmative Action and also Human Rights. Uh, advisory committee which has recently changed the names and I came in person to say thank you uh, for the presence this morning at the human rights breakfast from Patrick Murphy and from Dr. Laurie. It's the very first time we are received from Falmouth a presence of the superintendent and I was really touched. And also, I'm so excited to see so many amazing things that you're sharing. I seem to always land it in the, in the best day. <laughs> and also, I want to acknowledge how grateful I am for the presence of the members that you always send to the Affirmative Action Committee. And I was great informed that you are very open to the idea of restoring the Affirmative Action officer. So I hope that will be put it as a goal for 2020, and I want to wish everybody happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment, please? Okay, we'll move forward on the agenda. Act on the Woods Hole Partnership okay, no, Mem yeah. Memorandum of Understanding. Start with presentation. Okay, start with the presentation. Uh, since my introductions um, earlier, we've had a couple people join us. Uh, is it Representative Vieira? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what an entrance, thank you. Um, and so I just um, just want to make sure there was just someone that got behind me. Uh, yeah, we apologize for the bats. So we want to uh, give a little uh, bit of an overview of the um, partnership, how this came about, and where we are right now. Um, as I said, uh, this has been uh, a year coming. Uh, we've done a lot of work, and I want to um, publicly recognize Dr. Tellier. Um, I can honestly say from the school system side, if it was not for her, we would not be where we are right now. And I so appreciate you and your entire team. And again, thank you to all of our partners. Um, so we started out, what, what is our why? Why would we want to do this? Um, many of you have heard, um, when I first got here, it was an assumption I made that um, the Falmouth Public Schools must have the, the greatest 
uh, science uh, program ever because we are part of um, Woods Hole. And, and so as I, uh, we, I learned about so many wonderful things, that the connections between uh, different uh, scientists and students uh, within our uh, system. And what I really uh, was excited about is that these things are happening, but my goal was that it needs to be offered for every single student. And at our very first meeting, um, the attention to equity was extremely important. Um, and everyone agreed that if one or two students or 10 or 100 students have opportunities to engage uh, in this real world learning, that every single student at Thomas Public Schools should have that opportunity. And so this became one of our whys. We also wanted um, our experiences to be anchored in the curriculum. Uh, hence why we are so thrilled <laughs> that uh, Dr. Tellier could le help lead the charge about what our standards are. How do we make those connections? In one of our brainstorming sessions, it became very clear that there is uh, just more opportunities for connections than we could ever, ever actually make happen. But we really were able to, to narrow it down, that you're going to hear from Dr. Tellier in just a little bit. But we wanted to make sure that what the students were learning were, was happening in the classroom with our teachers, but were also in our living classrooms um, around our uh, vast and wonderful um, local uh, area. Thank you. Um, we want to elevate student learning experiences through hands-on, authentic opportunities that would be a challenge for the district to replicate. So um, we've had many uh, wonderful things that are happening, but we want to make sure that, um, that, the, that all, again, all kids have that opportunity um, and that we can replicate um, the activities that we're doing. Uh, and uh, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Tully will give you some examples uh, very soon about that. Um, LY, uh, sustainability. So we know that at times uh, the connections with uh, a scientist from one institute or another with our students may have been because there was a connection as a parent or a friend, but was it sustainable? If that scientist left, would we still have that program for those students? And so by having our directors uh, committed, this means that the work goes on uh, whether the it is this scientist or another scientist that is helping us. Uh, with this work. And so that sustainability um, piece is very important that we can continue. Dr. Tellier. So when we started to create the partnerships and really recognize what this <clears throat> formal uh, recognition of our work was, we started working with um, Deb Coulomb and the Thelma Stone Boosters and we took some field trips. So our field trips to Woods Hole, as you can see, it has buckled up uh, out of the dock. Um, we began in the winter. Uh, we had our first uh, visit in December. We went back with a second group of um, instructional leaders again in January. And then at the end of the tours through the institutions, and each one had common stops and different stops as we were going through. Um, we would end with a debrief. And that debrief would allow us to ask some questions of each other and share our understandings and then start to frame where we wanted to take the conversation to actually get deeper into the work. And also along the way to take stock of what was already happening. As Dr. Dewar said, there are places where we had amazing opportunities, but we hadn't had a chance to take them to scale and didn't really have a clear uh, plan for replication. So then we moved into monthly meetings. And um, about half of our monthly meetings were hosted by WHRC in the conference room. And um, then we started to use a couple of other spaces just to try and figure out as we were going and the size of our group, you know, where we can have a conversation and look to the resources. Um, so this is one of our brainstorming days, and we're going to talk about how we paired the brainstorming of over 100 ideas down to our, our three uh, strands. We were very fortunate that between the meetings, we would um, come here with a smaller group, uh, really who became a bit of a steering committee, and we would meet with Representative Fierro, who was helping us frame the conversation, and one of our members, um, who was also willing to lean in and say, hey, I have an idea for creating pitches. Thank you, Clark, very much. <laughs> Um, and so we created three strands based on the three pitches, and the pitches were ways to sort of say, here are the resources our institution has, here's what we can offer, what do you need from, from this sort of menu of available resources. Um, so in this instance, Garth Smelter representing NOAA came forward and said, you know, here are all the things that we have available. And so we started um, to create an idea about a day in the village, which is starting out this year as a day at NOAA, 
and um, Garth and Gray Simpkins and Chris Brothers and Celeste Cruz from Lawrence School have been getting together. They've revamped uh, several units to be able to prepare students for the day's <coughs> experience that they're going to have. Um, much of it's focused around sustainability, but it's also threaded. So if you think about all of our fifth grade students going out to the National Seashore for the Seashore Experience, we're working at looking at their sixth grade experience to start to build momentum towards the day in the village, and then ultimately the other side of that strand is the eighth grade extending the pilot that we had last year of students who spent a week on Cuddy Hunk Island in the STEAM Academy and looking to grow that opportunity. All born of really this concept from the pitch um, around marine life and ecosystems and our connection with NOAA. The second of those, oh, okay. The second of those, um, we actually had a member of the district, Michael Keeney, <coughs> who is our social studies department head, step forward and he made the pitch and he said, here's my ask, can you help me get the resources? So two different ways of looking at it. Um, and so Mike stood up and said, our standards are changing for social studies and geography and we need some support, some support to really make the geography come alive. And so in his pitch, we were able to connect, make a connection. And so Kate Ackerman, um, working with USGS, has been meeting with Mike fairly regularly. And we started a series of geo inquiries from the very sophisticated ArcGIS software at the classroom level entry for our kids. Um, so one example is they were following um, the Underground Railroad and layering the maps and showing how um, the movement happened as, as people moved north and what that meant, what resources were there. Um, so it's just one example. And um, also along the way, um, there's some professional learning that's create, being created right now for teachers to have uh, more time to kind of use the resources and figure out the best ways to introduce it to students. We've actually had a few math teachers come in and start to use these resources as well in their math instruction. Um, so taking this and looking at this, this is a thread that we would like to bring all the way through grade 11 and then have our students have the opportunity to bring that knowledge into some of their culminating projects in grades 11 and 12. So while it's not formal in the instruction, they'd be able to carry those skills and problem solving abilities forward into their work. And the third, so um, Shona Vitali is a community member who was joining us and representing uh, with the passion for science. Um, Shona pitched an idea around plastics and the impact of our decisions on our environment. And so this is perfectly um, complementary to the work that we had done around initiating an Earth Day Summit last year for grade three, um, hosted at the Seacrest. Um, and we were able to take students for a short while out on the shore. We ended up bringing them in. Um, but Marine Environmental Services, so Christina Lovely and Chuck Martinson were also there. They were able to show oyster um, filtration demonstrations. And so this year, with the support of Family Education Foundation, one of the ways that we're growing within this partnership um, is to offer mini grants to our teachers to run stations, to offer more stations at our Earth Day Summit. Uh, professional learning, preparing students as they come forward through an AmeriCorps volunteer affiliated with uh, Marine Environmental Services and then to have our teachers have smaller groups at each station to have deeper learning while they're there. So just part of that elementary articulation as we start to put uh, really what we're trying to create is a vertical thread. So in our professional learning, we know that we have more work to do with some of the um, learning experiences we want to do in the classroom so that when we have an opportunity to use our community <coughs> as an external classroom, as that learning environment, our students are prepared to ask some pretty deep questions and get their hands dirty in, in what they're learning. So this is just looking at those three strands kind of spread out over our K-12 experience. So we would be remiss if we did not give credit for um, getting started. Um, so the, uh, yeah. okay, so we, with lots of support. So when we started having the conversations um, with the uh, directors, um, Representative Vieira was instrumental in helping us arrange the meetings with the directors and setting down. We had some really rich conversations about what the commitment would be. Um, and everyone uh, from all the institutes really stepped up and, and had um, basically said that they would also identify a liaison so that um, from the Family Public School side, we would have one contact person and then that contact person would um, be able to um, help get um, the, the people involved that needed to be involved in how we're developing, kind of, and being the, the uh, 
communication back and forth between the work that's being done um, and each institution. So um, thank you, uh, Representative Vieira, for um, helping us. Um, and he also um, shared many of his own ideas of how to keep moving this on. So he's been a, a, a real partner in the work. We appreciate that. As well, uh, we want, uh, as Dr. Tellier had mentioned, um, it really started with the Falmouth uh, STEM boosters. Uh, Deborah Plum uh, was very instrumental in uh, getting us into each one of the institutes and really showed us. So this was, um, we had some of our administrators that had never been in many of the, the um, institutes in Woods Hole. And so it was just very eye-opening. And the uh, opportunities were just um, endless of what we saw. And then Falmouth Education Foundation, um, at the, the big supporters of our district, and we're so always very thrilled um, to have them involved. And on many, uh, many levels, uh, in many grants, um, they've been helping individual teachers with a lot of this work. And um, Ellen Grohl uh, visited one day and said, um, how can we be a part of and how can we support the bigger picture um, that you have? And so with a district grant, um, that we started, they um, uh, have been able to support this work and have been alongside with us. So I just want to make sure that we uh, also um, talk about our supporting partners. So our next steps. Um, so we had, um, so we're right now organized into having a fall and spring form. We just had our fall uh, form uh, right before the Thanksgiving um, break. Uh, we're looking at this as um, everybody that's a partner uh, being present um, to hear updates about the, the strands, to think about uh, where people continue to connect, where they can lean into the work, um, and then possibly think about um, new pitches. So we're starting with the three strands. Um, we expect over the next three to five years we're going to um, grow exponentially. And so by uh, being able to be together and have that opportunity um, uh, will uh, not only grow the current strands, but I think expand beyond. The subcommittee work will continue. So all of those that are involved in each one of the strands that Dr. Kellier um, spoke of um, will continue that, uh, that work. And then that is really the connection um, with the schools and our teachers and the professional development so that um, our students have the, those opportunities. Um, the advisory uh, that I mentioned and then community projects and partner participation, which is another area that we just started talking about in the fall. So how can we have, um, at our um, high school level, how can we have some participation around project-based um, learning uh, and passionate um, areas that our students have and be able to make those connections um, as well. So um, one of the things that uh, I have to drum roll, we're getting ready to, uh, I hope, sign this um, agreement. Um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Ryder had um, talked about in the beginning, um, one of the roles of the school committee is to support the superintendent and, and um, <laughs> superintendent's initiatives. And I have to say, I could not imagine having a better supportive board ever. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, Bill? I guess that uh, means we have to make a motion. <laughs> Can I have a motion to act on the Woods Hole Partnership, please? Make I'll a make, motion. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll make a motion. To a second. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Further discussion? If not, we'll vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, would anyone um, like to uh, come up to the table first? And I don't know, um, to, to begin, I don't have any particular order. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, Representative Vieira, I don't know if you want to step in. We've got... Um, All right, I think so. He came up with a pitch concept. <laughs> and is, and is much further in the alphabet. But, uh. <laughs> That's so, um, as we come up and sign, um, uh, Garth Spencer is representing uh, Noah, and if you'll flip to, uh, yeah, yes. Would you like to share? share uh, the There's a drum roll. Anna's her name. So the uh, memorandum of understanding. Uh, you'll see our um, partner goals. 
And our overarching, um, I mean, I'm sorry, our, uh, overarching goal and our contributing goals over here. So they are listed within the um, partnership agreement and outlined and everything from the presentation is basically outlined in this um, part, uh, in, in the agreement. Every uh, partner has uh, read uh, the agreement, has uh, provided input and changes and all of those were incorporated. Um, so we are now Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thanks. All right, uh, Meg. Meg Tybee is the director of Huey. I'm uh, not the director. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Vice president. Okay. Vice president. My my apologies. <laughs> Continue to go down through the list. Then. Um, keep your pen. We'll keep your pen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep your pen. Um, so David Mark Welch from uh, MBL. Dave McGlinchey from Woods Hole Research Center. Here. Is this a good time? <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
he signed a few things. Thank you. How many middle names do you have there? <laughs> I'm Portuguese a lot. <laughs> All right, and Mr. Wright, would you join me? Yes. To sign with me with the Family Public School. Still needing those pens. <laughs> I'll add those. Where are the pens? Where are the pens? Where are the pens? What? I need a pen. What? I like it. A pen? You get to take your fish. Pretty good. Okay. Can we just get pens? Can we all get pens? Hmm? Get it. Too far away. Tonight, um, the director. Um, I'm okay, I'm sorry. There you go. We need to come over for the picture, though. So they are here represented, but um, they are going to have the have it signed afterwards. They had selected they wanted someone. Uh, yeah, so, sorry, I should have announced that. Um, <laughs> I think we need some people in front. Or do you want me to take it? Did that light go out? Oh, you did it. Thank you. So I'm out of the way. You know, that's the director of Awesome right there, everyone. <laughs> 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 You're in the Enterprise shot, Sharon. Say oceanography. <laughs> We're tall. We're tall. Estuary. Estuary. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. But that was my job. Well, I guess I'm going to go Yes, we have extra um, Thank you. So, um, we, we want you guys to ask Yes. We have a little Yes. 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 I feel like I've got a little sure blackmail right, right here going. I'm just going to stick with my little bit. I know. <laughs> 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 No, not that one. No. Anyone? <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> 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 
kidding. I didn't want that one. I just wanted one. Do you want the pink one? <laughs> I will not take the pink. Doug? Excuse me, Doug, the floor is yours. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, well, thanks for having us tonight. I'm Doug Brown, fellow selectman. I'm here with the Palmer Collective, uh, the Peter Lopes, Dave Vieira. I might speak to this. I don't know if you were here for this today. Okay. And Kathleen Jesperson, uh, together we can. So these folks have formed a partnership to uh, request to use the former senior center as a uh, veteran center. And we've been making these plans for a while now, and only this year found out that the senior center actually has been sitting on school property all this time. <laughs> it's a bit of a surprise. So we're here tonight to ask your consideration for relinquishing that property under the, to the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen so that we can create a lease with them for their purposes. And I'll turn it over to the veterans group. Ms. Mustafa, I think, is the, the leader on this. Good evening. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions you may have, so uh, fire away. Do we need to make a motion to this? Before, before the questions? Yeah, that's. Yes. Okay. I'll make a motion. No. We're going to act on no, act to declare the property located on 300 Dillingham okay. Avenue surplus. Okay. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. I move that the Falmus. School committee declared that a portion of, I'm sorry this is lengthy, but it has to cut, um, touch all of the things in the, in the deeds and everything. I move that the Falmouth School Committee declare that a portion of the 25 acres of land acquired by the town of Falmouth as, as authorized by the vote of Article 41 of the February 19th, 1959 annual town meeting for the Morse Pond School and not used for school purposes be declared surplus for school purposes and may be transferred by vote of town meeting to the Board of Selectmen for municipal purposes. The land is described as a parcel known as 300 Dillingham Avenue and is the site of the present senior center. The parcel contains 1.6 acres and is shown as parcel 5 on a plan titled Plan of Land in Falmouth to be acquired by Town of Falmouth for school purposes, scale of 40 feet to an inch. October 1st, 1959, Charles A. White, CE, sheet number two, um, which plan is recorded in the Barnsell Registry of Deeds and Plan Book 152, page 85. For, for title, see order of taking deed dated up December 28, 1959, and recorded in said registry in Book 1084, page 364. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Um, there was the presentation at town meeting on this, and um, I'm just very impressed with what's going to be happening there and that you're meeting that need in our community. And so I thank you for moving forward with that. Um, I, I also think that obviously this was something that was you know, 1959 is when this happened, um, and has already been assumed that this is not necessary for the schools. We didn't even know necessarily that this was um, any school property. I just did want to say for the record that there are a lot of needs for the schools, and so just relinquishing school property is not something that we take lightly. And um, and obviously, the situation is very different, but um, in in normal circumstances, I wouldn't be um, in favor of that. I'm obviously very much in favor of this one, and I will be voting yes. But I did want to just say that, you know, our school property is important. Um, we have a lot of needs in our community and our schools, and um, I just want to make sure we're always balancing that. Any other comments? Um, <clears throat> I had the uh, the good fortune uh, to meet with Mr. Mustafa and learn a little bit more about the project as well as. Uh, with Jill Bishop and and she was kind enough to give me a, a brief tour of the property because I just if I'm going to vote on something I really want to know what what's what it's being used for and what it potentially could be used for 
Um, I think it's a building that's a very viable building that will serve the veterans well. Um, and it's not lost on me. And first off, I have to say thank you for your service because uh, uh, Mr. Mustafa and other veterans, uh, yours and their service, without that, we wouldn't be sitting here uh, being able to have this discussion. So again, thank you. Um, and the need is definitely there. And I do, and I, I would be all in favor, and I am all in favor. Uh, with that said, uh, with, you know, under, under Title VII, Chapter 40, uh, Section 9, perfectly within the, the flow to, for us to then delegate it to the town, to the town, to then lease it to you guys for a dollar, uh, for a five-year lease. What I would like to have at least minimally mentioned, if not be part of a uh, addendum to the, to the motion, uh, to be on record that uh, should, for any reason, I'd love to see the veterans group take advantage of this uh, for 100 years, but uh, should, for any reason, uh, it not continue on, uh, to have it revert back to be school-owned land. Uh, with that said, I mean, we've had different situations come to mind where uh, I wouldn't be representing my constituents uh, with that being so close to Morse Pond, uh, where people have uh, vested uh, uh, feelings of not having certain facilities or other facilities um, so close to the school. Uh, I would have been, had we had gone for a vote for that prior discussion, I would have been uh, against having that facility that was going to go close to Morris Pond. With that said, uh, we've had other things in town that if we had future hindsight, uh, like the windmills and things of that nature, uh, we'd say, geez, I wish we didn't do that or whatnot. Uh, so I would like to invest future hindsight into this, that if, if uh, your group does not continue using that at any given time, that it would revert as a memorandum of understanding that the uh, uh, land ownership would revert back to the schools. That's what I would put out there. But again, thank you for your service and for what you're going to do for the veterans. Thank you very much. Um, so do we have to make a um, It's, it's I, on record. I, uh, so your, your statement's on record. Do we need an addendum at that point in time? David. I'll refer to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think one way we can do this is that the, night, uh, the vote tonight is to declare the property surplus at this point. The jurisdiction will not change until the legislative body takes action. So there will be a motion uh, under a duly posted article at the next town meeting. Uh, and so d between now and the, and the town meeting, um, we could look at the right of first refusal, should the town not be using it for that. Uh, we would go back to the school committee and ask, would you like to reacquire? The, the transfer of ownership in the property has to be done each time by a vote of the town meeting. But within the motion for this transfer, we could invest the right of first refusal uh, f to go back to the school committee should we not continue to need it for the purpose that, um, that we're acquiring it for. For our purpose of our committee, I would like to make an amendment to the motion. And uh, David, you bring up a good point of, I think within the course of the town meeting, since those, the town meeting body wasn't aware that it was a school land, I think minimally, you know, whether or not a re-vote is, is necessary, minimally at least they need to be informed of that. So where that first vote, vote, someone would say, okay, I'm still in favor of it even though it's school land. Because they didn't have that, but they didn't know that at the time. I think there was mention of that in the article, wasn't there? It was in the article, but we did mention uh, during the discussion. It was either in the body of the article or the explanation. I'm pretty sure. So you still voted on it, even though you knew it was yeah. school land. Yeah. Okay. That's so a the spirit of town meeting to endorse the idea. Because it wasn't a it, was, it was a will of the body to move forward. Then you needed to declare right. surplus. Declare surplus. There still needs to be a transfer vote. Gotcha. And the transfer vote then would come at town meeting in, in April. April. Okay. And the right to first refusal could be worked into that, that type of a motion or any other language that we vet and feels appropriate. So the right of fir first refusal would come back to us then? If that's the language that, that we want to pursue, we can do that. Your vote tonight does not give up this property. This is still under your jurisdiction until the legislative authority transfers the jurisdiction. You are merely voting it surplus to the needs, which makes it subject to the vote of the town meeting. Your statutory authority allows you to control the property under your jurisdiction. Town meeting can't just go and say, hey, we're going to go unless we have 
a statutory special act to take it by eminent domain, which we've never done, <laughs> and we won't do, by the way. Uh, so you, you declare it surplus. That allows the legislative authority to then transfer the jurisdiction of the property. So it's a three-step process. Do, do we want to continue to go in this direction? Town meeting says yes. Second step, is this OK? Is this considered surplus to schools if you say yes tonight? And then the third step is we still have to go transfer. If something falls apart in April, it doesn't happen, it's still your property. OK. And you have to see John, go ahead. Uh, just again, I want to re reiterate it. I'm strongly in favor of making this happen for the veterans. This is, this. what I'm discussing now is just in the event, for whatever reason, 20 years from now, they for some reason aren't using it. I want the schools to be able to say what's going to be, you know, what's going to be going in right next to, very close to Morse Pond. You want to make that an addendum then? Yeah, I'd like to make the, so the official addendum, I'd like to make the addendum that uh, we uh, incorporate a memorandum of understanding uh, that should, for whatever reason in the future, uh, the veterans group not want to maintain uh, their facility there, that the land ownership would revert back to the school system. So you have to but nowhere in this nowhere in this motion does it mention the veterans. It's all it's all we are is sending it. But I'm mentioning the veterans. I think what you'd probably be after is what David mentioned the right yeah. first refusal mm -hmm. after, mm -hmm. uh, and that's at the sure. later stage when we had town meeting. Probably. I defer to our chair. I'm fine with the right of first refusal. I don't know if we need the addendum, to be honest. I think that it was pretty clear how yes. uh, Representative Vieira yes. pointed out Spoiler. that this is just a step one in the surplus. Step two is how we're going to word it at town meeting and then how the town will vote and then it will come back to us. Yes. So I. I think, okay. And so a placeholder article on the warrant that says that we're going to take a vote to transfer <laughs> jurisdiction. Any other caveats around the transfer, I would deem as moderator, the other half, uh, okay. <laughs> that it's within the scope of the article. So we can work with Frank Duffy, we can work with your, your council uh, to make sure that the language is uh, satisfactory to everybody's desire to have it come back and not be used for something else. Okay. Any other discussion? I just have a, a clarification okay. question. Has this property ever been used for school purposes since? 1959. <laughs> no, it's actually been under the jurisdiction of the Board of Selectmen because nobody really realized the technical uh, placement of it on the lot. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, thank you. If I might answer that, uh, back in uh, 1959 when I first got here, uh, the only thing that they did when the school was built, the children used to cut across there to go to the, uh, the rec building uh, area to you know play in the field and John and I talked about that and as far as it goes as an open invitation if you ever want to bring the children in there just let me know I'll make sure the door is open they can sit down get their instructions on what they're going to do and then go from there over to the uh, you know to the playground they were still using that path in our day I think too. Mm -hmm. and that was actually right that, that senior said before the wetlands protection act that wetland was filled in to build the senior center. That's why the water was out a few years ago. Right. <laughs> I, did, I did read that. We yeah. filled the swamp in before the wetland was I did read that. It was right. filled in. <laughs> uh, any other discussion at all? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So close it is. Thank thank you very I want to thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Turn it back on, sorry. <laughs> we'll move on. Uh, presentation of Superintendent's Goals and Progress. <laughs> yes, um, we've got to get the presentation oh, up. I'm sorry, we turned it off. Yeah. 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 Oh, we're getting that up to speed. Andrea, John, thank you. I appreciate your input thank you very much. You didn't thank me for reading the long motion. Oh, I, and I, yes, thank you, Terry, for <laughs> endorsing that. <laughs> Frank Duffy ritual.
انا اشرف طول العمر I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, everyone has the presentation in the packet. Um, for the audience member, we have extras if you would like a packet. Uh, so the, uh, in, uh, earlier in the school year, um, I sh uh, shared the super, um, my superintendent goals. Um, the district improvement goal was to form a committee to address the homework policy concerns in the K-12 schools. And this was a um, joint interest goal uh, between the school committee and uh, myself. Um, since um, the uh, establishment of the goal, we have conducted uh, one community meeting on December 3rd. Um, Melissa and Bill actually um, uh, facilitated the meeting uh, and we had um, I think a nice turnout um, of the meeting and we had um, lots of discussion, rich discussion, so I appreciate that. Um, the principals have engaged uh, teachers in um, homework discussions. We've conducted the student, uh, family, and teacher surveys. Um, I'm very pr proud to announce that we've had over a thousand responses onto the student uh, survey. So that was uh, great. Um, Dr. Tellier and I um, actually visited the um, student government representing uh, about 40 members representing freshmen through seniors um, this morning and the uh, topic was about homework so we were able to also have um, some interaction with the students. Um, I want to thank um, the family members that filled out the surveys. We had a nice uh, response, um, well over uh, 300 surveys from families as well. Uh, so we appreciate all that. Um, uh, and thank you to the staff members uh, for con uh, filling out the surveys. Um, we had a, a, a nice response. Um, so now we're in the process of collecting names for an advisory um, uh, committee. We have our, our parents identified and we're identifying uh, teachers from each school. Um, the dates are set and uh, so between January and uh, through March we will uh, be meeting to look at um, the research, um, our own local uh, data that, uh, from the surveys, uh, the current policies and we will be set, um, I believe, uh, to make some recommendations back to the school committee um, come uh, springtime. On the second goal, that's uh, second district improvement goal, uh, was to implement the district framework for student success, um, progress toward the goal. Um, the principals um, shared the, the, their district action steps um, at the school level. Uh, we have uh, principals identifying the quantitative and qualitative data um, that tells each individual school story. Uh, and we are in the process now of identifying uh, gaps in the district plan and the school's plan um, to make sure that we really are implementing every um, aspect of the um, plan. Uh, the third goal, the student learning goal, uh, a continued focus on access, equity, and opportunities. Um, I think tonight's uh, presentation was um, the first uh, step in one area that making sure that uh, our um, plan uh, really reaches every single student and that's part of that equity uh, piece. But um, progress toward the goal. Uh, in addition, uh, we've uh, met with uh, individual principals a total of 38 times, uh, conducted walkthroughs, we reviewed data and we're focusing on our discussions. Um, uh, with the access equity and opportunities when we meet. Uh, we meet with each, I meet with each district um, director uh, weekly and our uh, all administrative goals were set by October 30th. Uh, at least one goal was focusing on the excess equity and opportunities. Goal four was my uh, professional practice goal and I am uh, in year two of the uh, new superintendent induction uh, program. Uh, I've completed all assignments to date. I've met with my coach for a total of 12 hours, um, and um, so that, that just continues through year two. 
And that's my progress. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? <laughs> Um, on um, the surveys um, for the homework, um, who's going to be analyzing the data? Thank you for bringing that up. I, um, I should have mentioned that. Uh, so uh, Theodora Karpus um, was um, the uh, representative for um, the school committee, um, I believe several years ago when she was uh, a sophomore. So we actually, uh, I've been working with uh, Theodora. She, um, um, we used her survey that she did when she was a sophomore as our basis of the survey. We did add a few more questions that were um, relevant. There were some technology questions that were added um, and because her survey was focused on high school and we expanded it K to 12. Uh, so she uh, actually joined uh, Dr. Tellier and I today at the student government uh, meeting and um, took minutes and have already uh, have those typed up. She's uh, met with me on uh, Monday. Um, she has all the surveys and she's actually going to do the analysis um, while she's uh, back from college uh, for the next uh, few weeks. So I'm um, really looking forward. She's excited to uh, see something that was passionate for her that she brought up um, several years ago that it's, it's kind of a renewed interest. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I actually just had a comment. Go ahead. I thought that the, the evening was fantastic. The engagement was, um, the, the parents were so passionate about it. And obviously Melissa and Bill did a great job in their presentation as well. But I was really impressed with the student. Is it Jake? Is it Jack. Jack. Mm -hmm. He was just, he talked about leading the crowd and he really got everybody engaged. I just thought it was excellent. It's really good, beneficial. Yes. yes. Anything else? Okay. okay. Uh, presentation of Superintendent's mid-year cycle review. Yep, not a lot to report. Um, we needed three <laughs> evaluations, and we have those observations. Um, and so the next question is, if you'd like to see them in advance, you may. We can email them to you um, if you want to see what we observed with Lori um, for the mid-cycle. Otherwise, you can see them later in the year. Thank you. Questions for Natalie? <clears throat> Presentation of budget priorities. All right. Um, Patrick Murphy and I will um, present the next uh, presentation. So um, we, the presentation we're about to share with you tonight was shared with the budget subcommittee uh, last month. Uh, and we um, received some good feedback and uh, definite support. And so um, we'll share this with the um, um, committee uh, tonight. So uh, as an overview of the budget um, process for um, FY21, um, the district framework uh, for student success, uh, we uh, revised, um, I like to say enhanced, um, an already wonderful plan uh, in the spring. Uh, the collaboration on uh, implementation uh, was uh, widespread. And uh, it focused on um, new objectives. We did add uh, a new strand um, in the plan. Well, the identification of the impact on the budget. Uh, so we, uh, and based on that plan, we anal analyzed the needs um, for the budget. Uh, current conditions, um, the federal grants remain flat uh, at this time. Uh, enrollment anticipation um, is to uh, decline slightly. Um, there has been a trend and we would expect a, at least a slight trend. Uh, school choice anticipated to continue an upward trend. We've had um, over seven years of uh, growth and I see no reason why that would not continue as well. Um, we're currently negotiating um, our bargaining agreements and right now we have 72% of our current staff at the highest step. Um, the overarching guidelines, um, sustain progress from previous years, um, support site-based uh, decision making with uh, supplies and materials, use data to ensure equitable uh, resource allocation in order to ensure academic progress for all students, and enhance learning opportunities um, for all students. Um, as in um, last year, um, we talked about the reallocate then request. Um, we did a 
a thorough analysis of all programming, all staffing, and all student needs uh, last year. That was a year-long um, process um, with my um, team uh, here. And uh, we really feel like we have a handle on what those needs are. Um, so first, to reallocate to cover the needs, if possible. Uh, and then use vacancy savings from retirements and resignations as possible. And the next section, um, Patrick. Yep. So as you can see, uh, our class sizes uh, and our schools uh, enrollments are um, we're in good shape here. Um, I think the, the next slide is kind of interesting. That is a terrible slide. Well, uh, it somehow. didn't look that way when we. Yeah. <laughs> um, do, My yeah, apologies. When you say terrible, you mean the slide is telling not the information. Not the information. Yeah, it does look wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think what, what's important to look at is the, the trend by grade level of uh, what our student enrollment is. And the, the bubble year that everybody was had talked about previously was in grade eight has gone to grade nine. So that that is quote working its way through the school district. As you can see going uh, behind that the enrollment uh, you can see sort of the the uh, enrollment we have no uh, no longer have a class of three hundred students. Uh, anymore. That was the bubble enrollment that we had um, that went into grade nine, and then it, that's sort of the natural year where where people have where uh, students and, and families have a variety of options. Uh, the most important aspect of um, any budget over time is predictability. Uh, we've been fortunate with uh, yeah, we've been fortunate. If you go back and look at the last five years, I can give you uh, um, 10 years of data. But it's definitely within the last five years, we've had predictable increases from the town. And that is vital um, when, when your costs due to collective bargaining, et cetera, go up at a predictable rate also. And then we'll jump to student demographics, and I think that's back to the superintendent. Yep, you get to finish. Next three slides. <laughs> okay, student demographics yep. yep. here. All right. Um, <laughs> as you can see, the, there has been a change in the, the percentage of students on free and reduced lunch um, in fiscal year 20. One of the things that we've looked at there is, um, is understanding how the state does the calculation. And there has been a change in how the state does it calculation. Um, so what happens nowadays is that any student uh, or family um, that uh, has any type of, um, uh, is involved in any type of state program, like Mass Health, per se, which a lot of people on the case are involved in Mass Health, those, those are, that's uh, provides their children the ability to take uh, advantage of free and reduced lunch. And that's an automatic certification through the state. We don't make any judgments on that. That is just sort of when we do the, the, uh, uh, the uh, reviews with the state, that automatically happens. So, um, and the, and the um, calculation that allows people to qualify for that program and some of the other programs has changed. So that jump from 33% to 45% is not a reflection necessarily on some dramatic change in Falmouth in, the, in what is going on with the students in Falmouth. It's such a big change that we had to dig deeper to show, that, to find out what was going on with that number. So I just, but you can see the predictability of, of the numbers um, over the previous years. Over time, it has increased uh, significantly, but this jump is explainable due to the way the state has changed, uh, changed their calculations. Sources of funds for fiscal year 20 and what you've approved uh, are pretty straightforward. The local allocation is what, um, um, what, we've, uh, what was approved 
um, the additional funds through uh, grants, circle breaker, and school choice are within the range of what was approved to. And then the use of funds, that doesn't change because it all goes to labor costs. Uh, anything else is, is uh, incremental changes uh, here and there. Okay. So what are the priorities? Um, again, this is uh, with a lot of input um, from our stakeholders. This is part of our um, analysis of the needs in the district um, that we spent so much time last year um, doing. And we're looking at staffing. So um, I want to look at new positions um, to offer new opportunities for students. Uh, I want to increase uh, units to meet the current service delivery needs. Uh, and then on our contractual services, um, looking at the social emotional wellness, um, that intense wraparound services that we need, and uh, looking at the out of district placements. So if we look at um, one of the, the first priority, uh, staffing, um, because of the uh, new partnership, uh, we um, have been doing a great job. Um, Dr. Tellier has been doing a great job and her team. Um, but to continue with this work and to really look at the professional development at the teacher level to be able to write the units um, to make sure that we have that sustainability and that um, the opportunity for all students, um, you know, our hope is, is that we will be able to uh, have a project coordinator uh, for the Woods Hole um, project um, partnership that we just um, agreed to. Um, world languages, um, this is something that uh, you've heard me mention um, from time to time. Uh, we're looking at wanting to uh, grow our world languages starting at the youngest age, so um, from kindergarten, so that we have con assistancy kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, recognizing that we have a very rich Portuguese culture in Falmouth um, and being able to teach the language um, through a culture-based program, uh, beginning uh, with a one teacher in the fall of 2020 um, to start with the kindergarten first grade and then looking at to increase that uh, each year over time um, to include uh, Morse Pond and to expand our opportunities at Lawrence and at the high school. Expanded opportunities, uh, we have uh, a, a great request for the early childhood program by our students and it, we are definitely at a point that we could grow to a second early childhood teacher um, in that program. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, could we back, go back one minute? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the budget, at the initial budget meeting, um, one of the members uh, um, was asked about why the choice of Portuguese in this day and age, and I just wanted to point out what about the two language possibilities at Morse Pond, too. Yes. Okay, I didn't mean to tell no, you. No, no, thank you. But um, would you like to share that? Or? No, one of the members of the committee, you know, said that in this day and age, and it found this kind of, it's unusual to have the Portuguese, but when they get to Morse Pond, then it'd be two languages. Spanish would be the other one. The, yeah. Um, so Portuguese is um, our um, most spoken second language in the district yeah. um, by far. And then the next language is, is Spanish. And so um, we know that when students uh, learn how to learn a language, um, it is easier to then pick up um, a third language. So if kindergarten through fourth grade, um, has the opportunity to learn the Portuguese language, it is not a big leap for them to choose a second language, a different language, a third language. So hope, hopefully in the fifth, sixth grade, they would have an opportunity to continue with Portuguese, but they could switch to, to Spanish if they wanted to. So having two languages, moving into um, Lawrence, where they would be able to pick up, possibly having a choice between three languages and then at the high school, um, having the, the option of, of four languages. So that um, it's, it's the right age levels to add and switch and give students choices as they, as they move through. And we also have a requirement for graduation that's really hard for some students, so. One more thing on the Portuguese topic, just mm -hmm. has there been any talk about the challenges of 
teaching Portuguese. There's so many different, you know, dialects and different ways that mm -hmm. Portuguese speak. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be, I, I'm all for it, but I do think it's going to be yeah. a challenge to be able to, I don't know if it's something that's So it was a concern of mine as well. And um, so um, I did talk with the um, consulate um, from New Bedford, and we've had um, many conversations since then. Um, she has assured me that that is not an issue, um, but it is the same as Spanish. There are many different areas, um, and so where you um, uh, hire a Spanish teacher and in the, in the different regions, the dialect can change, but it actually is universal, and it's the same, she explained, with Portuguese. So whether um, it's from the, you know, the language from the uh, Azores or from uh, Brazil, or for Portugal, that the language itself, even the the the, the dialect might be uh, slightly different, but the it, the language itself um, would be universal across. Is how it was explained to me. It was a concern. <laughs> so thank you. Good question. Um, so yeah. I'm sorry. Languages, yeah. <laughs> we won't have to come back later. Um, so. It, it sounds like there's a, a lot of resources going to be invested in this. And one of the questions that came to mind is if you're starting with certain languages, and I understand that there are going to be expanded options uh -huh. the older you get, but in a good likelihood that someone's not going to want to completely start from scratch, that that could skew what is happening at those other grade levels, right? Because if you haven't had any introduction to French and you've spent some time investing in Spanish, then jumping at seventh grade into French, like there might not be the same kind of split that we have when that's the first time that you're being introduced to the two of them. Um, so I'm just sort of thinking about resources, <coughs> this heavy investment now, and then all those <coughs> add-ons as we're going forward, and sort of all the places we need to be putting in resources. Thank you. Okay. So trying to balance between expanding opportunities for students um, and also addressing, um, if we can just go back to that last slide, thank you, and um, looking at what our needs are as well. So um, we, right now, for our, uh, we need a .5 ELD teacher because uh, that area is growing and um, the number of minutes that's required per student, uh, for each student um, right now would require us to have another .5. Um, that is actually minimal. Um, if we can do a .5 next year, um, it's going to be very quickly into the next year that we'll need another .5. Um, so we know, that we know that we need to be looking at that over um, time. The Title I positions, the grants are not covering all the cost, so we know that that's a, uh, an issue. But the Title I positions, um, again, are an absolute need for our, our students. Um, the occupational uh, therapist uh, we're looking at, that we, we need an additional. And we, um, the, the data is really telling us that we need an additional school adjustment counselor at the high school. So a third um, uh, adjustment counselor for the high school is um, on our, our list of needs. And so always trying to balance, you know, what we know that we need, but moving beyond um, just the, the basic needs that, that we need to provide for, for students and continue to look at those expanded needs. Um, just like we opened up the theater program this year uh, and it's been well received, um, students should have opportunities. Even if um, we have less students, the same, Every one of those students still deserve to have every one of those opportunities um, and their choices. And so that's um, where we're coming from on trying to balance the two. I have a question mm -hmm. on the grant. The Title I positions, grants do not cover cost. Mm -hmm. In the past, have they covered cost? Yes. So then there's a cut in those grants. Uh, uh, the people in the positions are uh, make more than what they grant. So our needs have gone up, the people in the position uh, continue, and um, there's either been flat funding, right, or um, less funding in different, different years over time, which is, is difficult. So. And those grants should be then evaluated on a yearly basis based on school and mm -hmm. based on numbers? Yes. And so then what we do is just then reflect those 
grants that we can't cover back on the school district, correct? Mm -hmm. Wow, that just goes around and around and around. Excuse <laughs> me for that sarcasm. I think question. Sam, sorry. A little history. The Title I grants have been going down for over 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Short, <laughs> <laughs> not so sweet. <laughs> So, um, and the second priority I mentioned is the social emotional wellness. Um, so the uh, contractual services uh, needs, uh, we um, have been receiving um, services from um, Gosnell and we have counselors in all of our buildings. Um, they um, service many students and they're, they're very much needed. Um, there has been a shift in their ask. They've been in our district, um, this is our sixth year now. Uh, it started out with a uh, tower grant and that's how they were funded. Uh, in the last couple years um, the tower grant had ended and they've continued to offer services uh, but now um, the, the request is for us to pay for the services. So this is uh, a new line item um, that, that needs to be considered. And our out of district placements, although uh, still a low over um, years in the past, um, we are still seeing some very intense needs and um, we're, we're, we're creeping up uh, a couple students uh, in that out of district. So what, keeping an eye on that, we don't know exactly where we are, but um, we're, we're putting it here because we're foreseeing that, that um, we're, we may need to put more money in this area. I have a question mm -hmm. on the Gosnell. Are they not billing the students insurance? So they are, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm just wondering what exactly their ask is to cover. So um, they uh, talk about the overhead um, supervision uh, being one of them and um, the, the difference between um, there are some counselors that um, do not have their license to actually be able to bill uh, the insurance and then the gap between um, what they receive for the insurance and what the cost of their um, rate. So are they seeing the students in our buildings? Yes. Uh, okay. And they have some non-licensed personnel uh, counseling students? Correct. With supervision. With supervision. Sure. Yeah. Okay. The question yes. about the out of district placements mm -hmm. are those more um, behavioral out of district placements, academic? What? What are? Why are people? You know, why are kids going other places? Right. Do you want to answer that, Doctor what Woodward? What we're seeing is they tend to be, you know, again, all individualized decision making, but they tend to see what we're seeing the increase would be for students with more of the significant social emotional needs. Thank okay. you. Okay, Patrick, I'm going to sure. toss the ball back your way. <laughs> so uh, the first line is um, is an important line that you know th there are. 650 employees. There's a lot of uh, a lot of activity. Uh, you know, people make life choices. They, they move. They uh, so so the work that gets done uh, over the course of a year uh, to make sure that that we are staying within our budget is you know requires a lot of individual decisions about specific uh, choices on staffing at you know, when an opportunity becomes available to us. So that's a nice way of saying that, you know, sometimes we, we can't fill a position or we don't fill a position and um, and we're looking for the opportunity uh, when staff move those types of things. Um, point number two. So there was, as the superintendent portrayed, there, there are uh, some needs and then there's some wants uh, but our overall budget does not allow for growth in additional staff. So that's a challenge, right? So this is the reality of what we're opening this, with this. Um, and then as, as we put it, uh, presented in a number of different ways, and I do have to compliment uh, a lot of folks in the districts. Um, the work that we've done 
to uh, keep children in our school district has been extraordinary. And it, and it's, it makes financial sense, uh, but it's also really, really good for ch children. And the number, the, the number of children that uh, found that places in that district placement now is at a historic low. So that, that has been terrific work by a whole bunch of people in this district over time. And it, and it makes uh, good sense for, for the district also. We have to compliment the town that uh, over the last five, five or so years, five or six years, that any increases have been reliable. Um, what we're doing with our budget is really, it all goes to, uh, it all goes to labor. It all goes to staff. Um, when we talk about the non, non-salary side of the budget, we t we're talking about out of district tuitions, uh, we're talking about uh, buses, both uh, the, the special education buses that we run and the general education buses that are contracted out. And then, you know, with the $600,000 or so in supplies and materials. So any increase that we see from the town goes, goes to uh, selling the wages. Um, we've talked about school choice in the past, and that's been a huge addition uh, to the district over the last five years. Um, and then the final uh, comment was, was, you know, we have needs and wants in the district, and how to, how to prioritize those over time. I always like to say, in fact, our experience has been that we may not be able to do everything immediately. But if we keep continuing to look and prioritize over time, we can get things done. So if the position doesn't get done this year or next year, over, over time, if it's still a priority, we will get it done over time. Um, you know, the assumption for fiscal year 21 in enrollment is always a little tricky. The, uh, it is going down a, a bit. The, the reality, though, is it doesn't matter much from a staffing perspective because kids don't sort of leave the district in, in sort of um, buses of 25 <laughs> that go to North Fowler, right? Um, so so that, that, is, uh, that is a challenge uh, from a perception perspective, but it doesn't truly impact the budget in this significant way. One of the things I'm jumping down to uh, item, the bullet number four, chapter 70. Most of you have been hearing about the, the historic changes that the legislature have made uh, to the chapter 70 funding. What that means for Falmouth remains to be seen. What it, it will truly make historic differences to some of the, the uh, poorest communities in the Commonwealth, and that's extraordinarily important. Um, we will see in the governor's budget, uh, which gets released at, at the end of January, what Chapter 70 will mean. The challenge, though, is, uh, um, as the superintendent and I were talking about, is a timing issue. And w when those monies get released and finally voted on, and <coughs> given the town's budget cycle and our budget cycles. So that, that, that is a little tricky. What does that mean for the town in terms of allocation? decisions. I think, you know, this fiscal year we have to keep moving forward on, on our normal budget process and see what what the uh, any impact chapter 70 changes have over time um, they can benefit the district um, in some manner. We're still in collective bar bargaining. Uh, the the uh, bus contract, the bus RFP, uh, we opened the bid on December 19th. We're uh, here, my screams of joy or agony uh, on, uh, around that time. Uh, and you all know that this, uh, the uh, board, uh, select board's um, sort of budget uh, priorities uh, have remained the same from the end of September of 2.3%. Questions? I just have a question about the uh, CBTE early childhood teacher. Mm -hmm. um, is that dependent on the potential Chapter 70 funding, or is that going to sort 
sort of be implemented in September. Uh, Dr. Turner. So one of the things that we're trying to study is where the Chapter 74 funds, this is a conversation Patrick and I continuously have, fall to Chapter 70, yep. because we are seeing increase in some cases in enrollment, but we then can't increase after a certain threshold because we don't have another teacher, right? right? So we could increase what we generate for students completing the pathway if we had another teacher to do that. Yep. It would also allow us to then um, create the um, full day opportunity or AM and PM opportunities for students. So it's, it's in part tied to that unknown variable of it, what it means for faculty. And it's not, it, it's bundled into the chapter 70. Right. And it's not a separate line item for at least for municipal districts. Got it. So the Department of Education gives us an estimate of what we should see per student, however, because of that bundling. It goes through the top. Right. We are approved for the, the second position. That was part of the original plan. So we're approved. So in September, theoretically, we would have a second teacher. It's our intention. Fingers crossed. Okay, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> we'll see how the budget yeah. season goes. <laughs> great. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, excellent. Any other questions? Andrea. Uh, just a, a comment. Um, when going through and you got to the section on the historical trends, where it shows the last five years, which is really helpful to see, um, and I see that as student enrollment, and my first thought is, Yes, but student needs, right? And then that is on the second, but I almost think that there could be a way, because there's still more of getting this budget out to the community yeah, and explaining sure, sure, that, sure. and putting something like that um, all in one place so you can see how all that fluctuates, but the, the needs are still there and are getting even yeah. higher in some areas. It might tell the story a little bit here. We'll work on that for the January presentation. Mm -hmm. Melissa, go ahead, please. <clears throat> to circle back around the contractual needs uh, with the relationship with Gosnell, perhaps maybe we could reevaluate. Um, I, I think that it, it started out wonderful, and I'm not saying that it's not wonderful at this point. I just, um, I'd like to potentially just reevaluate the situation. Are we doing the best service that we can for our students of the district? Is there, are there local uh, groups that we could potentially look at? Uh, not necessarily sever the ties, but just do our due diligence to be 100% certain that the students are getting the best care and that we are being fiscally responsible to the district. So that's part of the conversation that we're actually having um, and trying to assess, do we go out to an RFP um, to, to, you know, just find out if there are other um, agencies uh, interested in the services and to find out what the cost of those services may be so that we can actually um, be able to answer your question. <laughs> so. I just want to make sure that yeah. we're doing everything yes. that we can. John, go ahead. I'd be in favor of putting that out to an RFP. Yeah. One of the things we did tonight was welcome partners. And I look at all those initials and I look at how fantastic this program could be. And I know through Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute that they do a lot of grants. I'm assuming that a lot of these are based on federal grants that these people can apply for. Is the educational component part of the federal grants and can that be part of the federal grants? Because if we need a coordinator, is it a possibility that grant money could take care of that? Uh, and again, that's just a question. I don't know the answers, but I know I have a friend who works at Huey, and I know he, they spend a tremendous amount of time on grants. So just going to throw that out on the table, because if any additional monies can be provided for our students to be successful, we need to look at that and pursue it in the best of our abilities to promote our kids. Any other questions? Any other discussion? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great presentation. It brings us up to date, and that's extremely important in today's world. Move forward. Discussion on policies D and E. Uh, any questions? Our policy committee begin, and we have any questions? They just wait for questions. We're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> we did. Uh, 
we vote the next meeting? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. So if there are any questions, we've set this up so that um, if you have questions about these, we have uh, either one of these um, sections, we have a, a policy subcommittee um, meeting before the next school committee meeting so that we can um, address any concerns or any questions, desires, wishes that anyone has. Okay. That's I'm the, still the point person mm -hmm. if you want. I don't answer anything, but I'll give them over to Megan to answer. <laughs> <laughs> No, I appreciate that. If the questions need to arise, we can uh, be involved with the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. I know I read them over and I jotted some things down, but uh, I'll probably look those over again and, and come, come with questions. I think that's good. Uh, I think the fiscal management goals and responsibilities were excellent. Uh, I, again, appreciate the time and effort that people in the policy committee are putting in because obviously it's lengthy, it's consuming, and there's a lot of work in that. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. But it does pay well, so. It does. <laughs> God, I haven't seen I appreciate the bonuses that we get. It pays in posted. The what? The bonuses of oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We do get any color we want. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We post it. Okay. Conduct routine business. Approval minutes of November 12th. <laughs> Um, motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes of November 12th. Second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Approve, approve minutes of November 19th, 2019. That was our workshop. Right? That was the workshop. Uh, and that workshop was, I believe that was Jim Hardy. Mm -hmm. And that was a workshop on open meeting. Uh, and I think for probably an hour and a half to two hours, I think we had some excellent back and forth. Uh, and I think it answered a lot, some of our questions, maybe all of our questions. But he gave us a great overview on open meeting law. And I think it was very well worth the time and effort by everybody. So uh, approval for that. Uh, motion to approve, please. I'll make a motion to approve it. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass. Superintendent's report, please. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to Dr. Spillane. Um, once again, he uh, gave uh, his time uh, and passion um, to two different forums uh, for us in November. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to our high school students. Um, the, the play this fall, uh, Check Please, was uh, fantastic. Um, I have to say that the, the students just just, it just feels like they had so much fun um, doing this play. Um, really uh, want to appreciate um, the director, uh, Alyssa uh, Guida. She um, has really proven to be an excellent addition. We had um, thir 37 um, students participate in this first play. Um, we, kn we knew that we got started late uh, with the theater program. We weren't sure um, how it would um, fare on this uh, fall, but there were so many students, they had fun, and, and um, so that was great. And we are looking forward to our spring musical this year, um, and we'll be making an announcement about that soon. Um, so you can um, see that there's uh, some other, we had the, uh, we've already mentioned the, the Woods uh, Hull uh, Fall Partnership Meeting. Um, the uh, one fun thing that uh, our team here uh, on for the um, serving the turkey dinners, we were all out at the schools, and that's always fun just to be able to interact with students at a different level and um, to enjoy um, some time with our food service workers that uh, give so much of their time and dedication and really care about our, our students. So it's, it's fun to work side by side with them. Um, the VIPS track meet is always popular. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, I did mention uh, to you that I did a um, FCTV interview with Eileen Preston, um, uh, the host of Solutions. Uh, she had heard about our Cape Kid Meals program that we started. Uh, and um, so uh, I believe I sent the dates out um, to everyone. I would like to, to uh, say, uh, in the um, briefing, it says that we have, uh, we've had 20 donations of totaling uh, $4,350. This has just been since mid-October. 
Um, so in two months we've raised that. But since we wrote this uh, briefing, uh, we've had additional um, 1,350 come in. So we are now at a total of 5,835. Um, and that's just incredible. Uh, again, I, I'm so proud to be a part of the Falmouth community. Um, they, they really take care of the schools and, and uh, our students. Um, we uh, received a check from um, Tori Clarkson uh, for the use of the space for the carousel. Uh, and um, I appreciate Ms. Oshman um, pointing out and giving us credit for being at the Human Rights Breakfast this morning. Um, I think it's an incredible event. Uh, some of the work, the awards given out to um, the uh, different groups of people that it's, um, that's doing really fantastic work uh, on the Cape. And so that's um, very good, good to see. Um, and um, we have a fo uh, follow-up report um, in your packet uh, tonight that Dr. Tellier put together um, on advanced placement. Uh, that was a question that was asked at last meeting, and so the information is there for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, historically, the Carousel of Light has always come to the committee proper and um, given us a little presentation and presented us the check. <coughs> Any reason why we changed that this year? Um, so we didn't have that last year either, so I, I could have been remiss. Um, they actually came to the office and presented the check last year, and I just I assumed I that that was the... Year. Year. They usually come and... Do a presentation? Like a little we, we can certainly have them as a pre, you know, to, to do a presentation. I'm sure they'd be happy if that's a... Am I right, John? It's, if that's a wish of the out. chairperson. Of <laughs> the check is usually just to give the check. Right, but don't they usually come and tell us and... I can speak to last year. They did not. Okay, I made it up. And okay. no, I don't think you made it up. <laughs> no, I don't Prior to that, I don't know. I can't remember. I feel Fast like I remember them coming. And 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 the, the front, very beginning, the first they did just to update us on on this. But for the past couple of years, it was a initially that they wanted a photo op. Now I'm not sure if they even have photo ops for. To we did. Okay. We did have a photo oh, op when, when they <laughs> handed the check. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't have so any we have a reason for an additional presentation unless no. it's something pertinent. Really. No, I just I, I wondered the change and I, apparently I made it up, so that's fine. I don't think no, they, they, did, no, they, but, did, but they did present last year. Last year. Yeah. They, they, okay. did, they, they did come, come and present, but it right. wasn't they did used to come. Uh, yeah. That's what I interviewed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can I just? I would love to say one more thing about. I'm going back to the Cape Kid Meals. Um, we have a Falmouth um, uh, resident that put together a polar plunge. Um, challenge and we had 12 people from uh, that live outside uh, of Falmouth um, that actually some of that money that I just mentioned was from which I thought was very creative and someone took that uh, initiative on their own um, and so was raising money from many different areas and the, the checks came in for that so that was just a, another side I wanted to mention lots of fun anything else sir Okay. Uh, committee reports. Oh, excuse me, Patrick Murphy. Yeah, sure. I apologize. <laughs> so I have been asked to do a couple of quick updates. Um, YMCA um, just updates. Good news that uh, three additional staff did start last week. Um, the most exciting news is that two two of those additional staff are from the high school. The, with given the labor market, given the challenges of uh, hiring childcare workers. Uh, for very short uh, periods of time, uh, the opportunity of, of trying to create a pipeline with high school kids, I think, is hugely important. They did confirm that they uh, refunded money uh, for any parent that put a uh, deposit down for drop-in services because they haven't been able to uh, provide those drop-in services. And they are communicating with parents in, in emails on a weekly basis, so which is uh, a nice addition uh, uh, for the communication of, of, um, in the improvement of the program. They are running um, uh, vacation programs. Uh, I think the next one, uh, or the, there was one in Wednesday at North Falmouth, and then there's going to be split uh, for the other vacations across um, multiple schools. Um, just, just to sort of spread uh, the work, uh, load for some of our custodial staff. 
Um, although I do say that, that the uh, YMCA program staff do uh, a nice job of taking care of things. Um, food service, there was a request for an update. The share bins that we purchased have arrived. Uh, they, they were put together by the custodial staff, and at the last moment we found out that we have a written permission from the health department on this. Um, one of the challenges on the share bins is there are regulations and training that uh, um, you know, are required from uh, various state and federal agencies uh, to use these share bins. The, the, um, the fear of, or, or the uptick in, in children with allergies, food allergies, is something that is, is a real concern in schools nowadays. It may have been different when we were uh, young. But, so these share bins are great ideas, but they do present some risks that, uh, that we all need to report and uh, address. Um, these salad bars uh, were are, um, ordered and they expect to be, uh, for the few schools that don't have them, uh, coming in in uh, January, there's still the challenge of making sure that children visit the salad bars and they don't just <laughs> gather dust. Uh, right. but there are real investments in, in the program and we'll see how, how those investments pay out. Um, just because it's a, it's a topic that you all drive by, um, the, uh, we've been working for about four or five months trying to identify a manager who uh, could uh, replace our flagpole up front. Unfortunately, uh, flagpole vendors are, not, are, are very few. <laughs> um, and one that we uh, had, uh, had uh, interacted with and, and thought they were going to move forward ended up selling this business. We found another vendor, and they uh, signed an agreement to uh, replace the flagpole because it is, the wood is, is, uh, can no longer be repaired. Um, and that uh, needs to be coordinated with the DPW due to that busy location down there. So eventually that flagpole will be, uh, will be replaced. Uh, it's something that will not run. <laughs> uh, and uh, for some of you know that, that our budget subcommittee did meet uh, this, this afternoon, and those discussions are, will continue. But, as we are in budget season, if anybody has any discussions or uh, questions about anything related to budget development and budget details, um, I always make this offer. I'm absolutely willing to meet with you. If you have a neighbor that is pestering you about questions, I'm willing to meet with them. So that, that is a standing offer I've made since I showed up that I'm always willing to meet with. Uh, members of the community to talk about how schools develop their budgets and what the details of the budget might look like. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very Thank you. much. Any questions? Patrick? Committee reports. Committee reports. John? Uh, a committee report, so to speak, uh, that uh, Sonia had mentioned earlier about Earth Day last year. So I'm working directly with her. Seacrest is committed and we're ex it's, uh, enthusiastic about April 22nd, 2020, hosting our second annual, and it'll be the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, too, which is pretty cool. Really? Unfortunately, that's the middle of vacation now, so we may have to look at an <laughs> alternative date. Okay. We were recently saddened to figure that out. Right, right. Well, I'll switch because I do have the, uh, the indoor rooms blocked just in case. <laughs> but yeah, no, we'll work with whatever the date is. Uh, with all these partners, in addition to the Marine Environmental Services, I mean, that's going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Any other comments on uh, committee reports? Requests for follow up? John? A follow up to kind of related to our earlier topic. If we could uh, somehow endeavor to learn if there are other properties around town that we own, that would be really <laughs> beneficial. I'd like, you know, however we could do that would be great. Well, we did start in 1959 tonight, <laughs> so at least that's a projection and a yeah. start. But no, you, but I mean, like the point. Barstool County of Deeds, anything that says yeah. Falmouth Public Schools on it, something, I mean, it's, it's research that's that's uh, you know worth the worth the effort to figure out and then and then if it is something that need, needs to be designated something else then we can move forward in that manner okay. too. Subcommittee reports update. 
Any announcements? Future future items first. Excuse me. Not so much a future item, but a request if we can look into um, each school's landing page, their web page lists the hours of the day. Could we add early dismissal time? Because it seems like there's always, as <laughs> Melissa's agreed with this, there's always a little bit of confusion around the half day, you know, what time does Morris Pond get out? So if we could just add that on the landing page. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think today was one of those Tuesdays. It was, yes. yes. Yeah. It, it sure was. the text that I received yeah. about Did dismissal. I text you? Did no, you didn't, <laughs> but I had a couple I others. I have to go back to other texts, because I Announcements, didn't want to any announcements? I'll leave you with a quote. Let us think of education as the means of developing our greatest abilities. Because in each of us, there is a private hope and dreams which, fulfilled, can be translated into benefits for everyone and greater strength for our nation. JFK. Motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. A jerk. Thank you. Oh, wow. She warned you about it. <laughs> what? Oh, no, warn me. Um, Ryan upstairs. Because <laughs> he's in the microphone. I do better. So, um, you're going. Drade has asked if um, there would be four people that would be willing to deliver. Um, the bags to the schools this Friday. Not Friday. What time? Hmm? What time? What time? Um, Even three if, if we get stuck. Yeah. Um, sometime in the morning. We try to get them there before noon. But um, she was just wondering if the school committee would. I happen to be out on Friday. Okay, you do. Okay, so Melissa's going to. Yeah, I'll do that. All right. What are bags? Thank you, Nona. Oh, Lisa, I'm sorry. Thank you, Lisa. Okay.